So you want to make a film set in the 80s? Well, me and my friends had a go here and I'd like to share that experience with you. Shit. 80 stuff, I like 80 stuff. Uh, I like the music, I like the fashion, I love the culture. I really like the anti-establishment side of things. Not so much with the American side of the 80s, but more so the British side of the 80s. That was something I wanted to recreate with the film I was making. So what you can expect from this video is maybe some tips and tricks on how you might go about creating this world, um, creating a realistic, believable 80s scenario. I think the key to pulling this off is to create a, a real feel of the 80s. It's not just necessarily about making something look right, but it does need to feel right. It's really important to create scale in these films. Uh, when you have no money, it's hard to go big. It's hard to make things seem big. And I think if you make a period piece, you're kind of making your film slightly bigger. You're creating a bit of scale, having cars, having bikes, having costume, having good music. You're creating this scale, which isn't really there. It's not really there, it's all an illusion. You know, we can't fill a field and blow it up. I think creating a realistic 80s environment is difficult. But if you work your way through the list like I did, then you increase your chances and you'll probably get it right. Turning! Slate one, take one. <laughs> oh God, what the fuck? First things first, it's really difficult. If you've made a film, you know it's really hard to make any film in any setting under any circumstances. And now, if you're gonna do a period piece, you've just decided to make life a lot harder for yourself because now every single thing has to be a little bit extra. It can't just be any car, it has to be the right car. It can't just be any top, it has to be the right top. And you have to bear these things in mind going into making a period piece, except that things are going to be a lot harder and you have to be very sharp because people who lived at the time are gonna have their eye on things and if you get things wrong you're gonna lose them it's gonna they're gonna come out of the story they won't be as invested and people won't believe it and then you, what's the point so story is where it all begins um, you've got to start with a good script if you don't start with a good script you're in a lot of trouble I got my idea from my dad so my dad grew up in the late 70s early 80s on a council estate and he's full of these little stories that are just lots of fun and they, they were just hooligans and the way they dealt with things I always found very entertaining so it was just a case of picking one of these stories. I said dad I think I want to tell the story about when you lost your motorbike and I'd like you to go into a significant amount of detail about it if you could. What I did was I went and got a dictaphone and I said dad when you when you got 10 minutes just sit down with it. Um, you know, click play and just say everything that happened to the best of your memory. I was surprised how emotive he got about it, but that's essential stuff to work from. That's what that he's going to be your reference. Whoever you're using, they're your reference. And the more emotive they get about it as a director, as a writer, it's more interesting for you. I think you have more to take from it. From there, I spent a year turning that recording into a script. That might seem quite long, but it can take a while to get these things right. And it's absolutely essential that you do get these things right. For example, uh, the dialogue in my film is accurate. I, Once I had done a number of drafts, I plucked up the courage to give a draft to my father to read. And he went through it and he kind of tore me a new one, but in a nice way. And he said that, oh, people don't say this, they say that. You know, people don't say bullshit, they say, bollocks and we went through it and we went through all of it so the dialogue matched the setting at the time and it's a little detail but it's really important um, but especially when you're going to show it to people who lived it during that time um, it just helps make the whole thing more believable more realistic something worth mentioning maybe is that some people said to not do the film in the 80s that you know why not just say it now I don't think anybody would deal with certain situations the same way we deal with things these days back then people used to just go and do things. It wasn't a case of like, oh, I'll go on Facebook or I'll put out an email or things weren't always like so insured and legal. Um, it was more a case of like, let's just go and get it. Let's go and get someone, let's go mess them up. And it's very exciting, it's very interesting, it's very real and that's something I really wanted to do with the film. It's absolutely essential that you grab people very early on in the film and you get people on your hero's side, on your character's side. And some people have suggested to me that I do sort of um, kind of petty things like making his mum disabled so that people care for him. And it's not a bad idea, I understand it, but 
it, for me it wasn't right. It just felt like an easy vote. I felt like what I really needed to do was just make it clear to people that this guy cares for his family. And in this particular instance, he cares for his mum. So I wrote in this little bit where he steals his mum's cigarettes but only to dispose of them because he knows that they're bad for her. It might not seem like much, but it was probably enough to make people realize that he's nice and that gives a better chance of people feeling sorry for him when things start to get more difficult for him. And that's absolutely key. Like if people don't care about your, your characters, they don't care about the film. Um, they don't care what happens, good or bad. And you need, you need that investment in your characters, otherwise, you don't have anything, I'm afraid. You just have a lot of, ooh, ah, and that's great, but that's not why, that's not why you should do this. <laughs> so locations are crucial. I don't know what the official practice is. I know a lot of people get the cast first, but for me, I felt like I needed somewhere to put these people um, first. I needed to go out and make sure that I had, I could create this at this world, this setting, before I went and made any phone calls. What's interesting about finding 80s locations is that it wasn't so long ago, so things aren't actually that different, which in a way makes things more difficult. When you set something in the 40s or ages, ancient times or whatever, you can, you can get away with very isolated places that are drastically different, that are in, not populated areas, but when you're setting something in an urban environment in the 80s, things are subtly different. These areas are often very populated, there are people living there and there are cars everywhere and buses everywhere and it can be really irritating. <laughs> Take your time. So many. There's so many. Just fucking convoy. You just have to wait. You just have to sit and wait. And you need to think about this when you find these locations. If you're filming on a street and there's a whole row of modern day cars, what are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? Because you need them gone. They can be very difficult to find. I ask around, go on Google Maps and I have a look, have a little look around for what I might need and then you have to go, you have to go and have a look. We're not looking for things that are picturesque like you might normally do. Uh, we were looking for things that are kind of ugly. Um, ugly in a pretty way. Eventually, when you decide, you have to try to acquire these um, locations, which can be really difficult um, because you don't have anything to offer these people. I might sound quite confident when I do it, but the truth is I'm nearly being sick in my car. Um, and the longer I leave it, the worse it gets. But you just gotta get out. You gotta knock on the door and you gotta ask. And we don't talk about money until they talk about money. Most people are actually quite nice. As long as you're very clear and very honest, but also very passionate about what you're doing, there's quite a good chance you can get them on your side. And it's not easy to do, but it has to be done. The way you schedule your locations is very important. Do, I don't recommend shooting in continuity unless it's absolutely necessary and achievable. If you're using the houses that belong to other people, then your schedule now needs to fit around them. You know, they, they have lives and you are number 11 on their list of 10 things. So <laughs> the, at the day after you've left, after asking them and they've said, yeah, chances are they've completely forgot about you. Not out of disrespect, it's just they have lives. This, your film is the biggest thing for you in the world, but it means nothing to them. So you have to make sure that you are persistent and polite and you have to keep reminding these people that, um, that you're coming back and you have to keep double checking that the date is gonna be fine because they might just forget about you and then they book a holiday to Tenerife or something and then you're screwed. What you're basically asking is, can I be slightly irritating in your life? Can I be an inconvenience in your life? 53 take one. Oh, love. You have to be very careful, but as long as you're passionate, like I said, and you're friendly, and you make things as easy as you can for them because you don't have anything to offer them. So if you go and get cocky and start demanding things, you're not gonna get anywhere. If you say the right things, they will let you do what you need to get done. It's one thing to find an old house. It's one thing to find an old house that is still old inside. Look to old people. Um, my auntie is well in her 80s and someone told me that, she, oh, she hasn't decorated since the 70s. Oh, yes. It looked absolutely perfect and it was just a case of making sure everything was all right with her and getting it done. Snark it. 28 take one. 
28, C3. No, we don't say C3. You say 28, take 1. 28, take 1. Is that it? Just 28, 1. There's no fags. There's no fags in your pocket, eh? Are they in my pocket? <laughs> I would Research, still running, still running. The second location was the garage that we're actually in, which is just an old garage. Um, as long as there's nothing, as long as it looks a bit old and dusty, like you're good to go. I think it's important not to get too hung up. You have to have backups. Um, one location in particular that gave me a lot of problems was the police station. I got so hung up on trying to acquire it that it took a lot of time and a lot of energy out of me and it never amounted to anything. I spent an awful lot of time trying to get that locked down. I went after it and it just wasn't paying off and I got very, very lucky, very lucky in the end that there just happened to be a disused room upstairs in the university which had a sliding door because that's what I was after. I was after a sliding window. As soon as I'd found one, I thought, I have to have this one, I have to have this one, but I didn't. So don't get too obsessed with specifics sometimes. I highly recommend that you have a car if you have to use public transport. Go do what you gotta do, but having a car gives you a certain amount of freedom to like travel to certain places. And I would have never found the location I used for the gypsy scene if I didn't drive, because that was just a case of me going along a road, glancing, and a few fields in I just saw a caravan. There's so much luck involved with these things, and you really need to be out there looking for it. Um, and you need to be putting yourself in positions where you can get lucky. I kept all my locations probably within a five mile radius, uh, which meant that it would only take a, number, a matter of minutes to get from point A to point B. It's crazy how timings work out. We finished filming on a Sunday, started on a Monday, finished on a Sunday, and we literally got the last shot as the sun was like setting. Like you need every single second that you can get because your arch enemy in any low budget filmmaking is time. Especially if it's exterior, you're just gonna get battered by this, the day. The day will just fly by and it's a miracle you get anything done. Like you just have to be efficient. I came early. I came early. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't go shouting that one too loud. You're constantly racing the sun and you've got to bear these things in mind. It's essential that you try and save as much time as possible. And to, one way of doing that is keeping your locations close to one another. The bikes in my film were originally going to be provided by a family friend who collected classical motorbikes. He just said, yeah, you can take anyone you want. It's never that easy. But then it wasn't that easy. About two or three weeks away from filming, he said that, I'm sorry, I've made a mistake and the bikes are not available. I just died because now my film that kind of revolves around a bike doesn't have a bike in it. I had a mini panic attack, but then I collected myself and I felt I just got to get on with it. So I went online, I went to Facebook and I joined lots of retro motorcycle orientated clubs. I messaged the admins saying what I needed, where I needed it, and if they knew anybody who could help me out. I did exactly the same for the cars went online, went for uh, classic car clubs that were near me and I knew what I needed and you've got to put out tons of messages and you, for every 30 you throw out you might get one. But I got a few back and then I, I went and met these people. What was interesting was a lot of these guys happened to grow up around the same time as the movie set and they actually understood the situation. It was the sort of thing that happened to them when they were kids and they could get behind that and they were more into it than I was so they were happy to lend me these things which is insane. I am literally asking people for their pride and joy. Can you just, yeah, can I just have it for a weekend? Like, it's insane. These people get stick off their wives for these belongings and they mean an awful lot to them and they're not replaceable so if I damage one it's really, really bad. It is by no means easy to acquire large props for free. It's not. Um, you just have to work with what you've got. Um, and the only thing you've got is a lot of interest and a lot of passion, hopefully. With props, large props in particular, you have to schedule for them. You have to schedule around your large prop. You need everybody who's related to that to be free. Everything has to line up, you know? If I scheduled it that we're shooting the Ford Escort Mark II scene on a Wednesday, but the guy who owns the car is at work all day, then that's not gonna work. And I have to change that, which is really hard. And scheduling is 
absolutely major. It will be the it will be the make or break of how your shoot runs. It's just one big juggling act, and it's a total mess 99% of the time. But you just got to make sure that you land in it. And the sooner you start planning, the sooner you get these props and these locations and these people and everything in place the better because you really don't want to be doing this last minute if you have big props you're gonna need a van they're not something you can just throw in a bag um, they need to be carefully scheduled and carefully transported to so make sure you have a friend with the van it's not just the big props that count small props make all the difference there are a few small props in this film like cigarette packs phones sony walkmans things like that um most of them i just bought i bought the sony walkman on ebay for about a tenner i um the phone actually belonged to my great aunt um but some of them i made i just googled what old cigarette packs were like i used my photoshop skills and just made them and stuck them on and you know make sure that you don't hold the shot on it too long because you'll start to see all the glue and stuff but it was good enough that it would pass I also made the motorcycle helmet so it was just a normal uh, motocross helmet which I removed the peak and some of the vents that are like more modern and I gave it a couple layers of spray paint so you can pick up a lot of this stuff for cheap you you know you don't need new things so go on eBay and or go to retro uh, cells and stuff like that car boot cells or just go in your garage and have a dig around and see what you got because it doesn't have to look great it can be old costume costume is key to any period piece and with 80s there's a lot going on i didn't know where to start so what i did was i actually went to a neighboring university which had a um, like a drama costume department and I found a student there who had some spare time. We went to a place called Molly's Den. She recommended it. It's, uh, it's like a retro shop but for lots of bits and bobs. They have clothes and they have items as well and it was great and this is much better than going to a proper costume rental place because I tried that and they actually charge you per outfit regardless of what you pick they charge you per outfit so if you just say I'm having a pair of shoes and that's it they'll be like that's 70 pounds no matter how much kit you have per person it will always be 70 pounds we managed to buy everybody's stuff for about 250 pounds everybody's stuff from head to toe 250 pounds which is incredible and personally I kind of like the items anyway so I kept most of them Admittedly, some of the flyers, the jackets, belong to relatives of mine. Cost you nothing, so there you go. Cost you absolutely nothing, and it looks the shit. So music, uh, I get quite shy about music in films. I think there's a tendency to want to put huge tracks on your films. At this level, I think it's really difficult to get good imagery, and there's there's always a risk that there, there will be a, a major imbalance. So if you shoot something that looks okay, and then you throw a monstrous epic track on it there's going to be an imbalance for me personally and it, it really takes me out of a scene the music should never overpower the imagery it should complement it and aid it you should never it should never really distract you from it too much and i think a lot of people do that they throw massive tracks on okay looking images i think i got away with it because the tracks i use are ska two-tone and punk and i don't really know what i mean by this but they're really like rough they're not, they're like, it's like rough music, do you know what I mean? There's no meat on it, it's just, it is what it is. Like I mentioned at the start of this video, it's it's not just about making something look right, it's about making something feel right, and music is a tool to help create a setting. It's not a go-to though, you can't just rely on it. Uh, everything has to line up and match, but certainly if, you, if you're very smart with your tracks, you can create this, this time. Cinematography, not my forte. Cinematography is obviously really damn important, um, but it's something that we struggled with on this film. That was horrendous. Something that always helps with cinematography is time. The more you, ha the more time you have to set up, maybe even do you know like a mock run, lighting setup, like it all helps. But we don't, we didn't have these luxuries we just had to get on with it and we only had a certain amount of hours in certain spots before we had to move on and it is something that me and Adam have discussed and the film yeah. did take a hit 
in its cinematography. I still love the bloody thing and I think it's great. And I think tonally it's right. You know, the film, like the music and everything else, it's not too jazzy, it's not too beautiful. It's kind of an ugly thing, but in a beautiful way. And I think the cinematography is exactly that. So it works. We get away with it looking a little bit rough, but that's because that's kind of what the tone of the film is. I think if we had more time, of course, we'd make it look a bit better. We missed some shots, that sucked. Seen in the garage, there's no reverse on Dave, so it's just on me for an awkward amount of time. We're just rushing a lot of stuff, and that had an effect on the edit. It's another reason to focus on your story a lot. If you have a great story, or a good story, and good casting, good scenes, and good moments, and you, people will let, let you off for cinematography related mistakes. You can have the most amazing film, the most amazing looking film ever, but if it sucks and it's got, you can, there's nothing to take from it, then oh, who cares? I'm not really that post-production savvy. I'm not really uh, techie or, I'm not I'm not very good at it, okay? I, I, I have good friends who are really good at it and they're really interested, so they sort of do that for me, which I'm very fortunate. The grade and things like that are really important for uh, creating a certain vibe. So some of the early grades for this film sucked. <laughs> oh God, I feel sick watching them. Everyone looked like a Simpson, they were so yellow. Watch a lot of films that you like the look of um, and watch a lot of films from that time. Um, look at photographs from that time. We took inspiration from This Is England and things like that. We made a, a deal out of making everything slightly red and we eventually added uh, some film grain effects so the film looked a little bit rough because the the initial footage was sort of a bit sharp and that wasn't really, I don't think it really suited the film, we wanted it to have a, a bit of texture to it. I think doing a period piece is super challenging but that's the point, that's why you're doing it. I think it will give your film an edge over other people's films. Chances are other people didn't go to the length that you did and because it's bloody hard but it will pay off because it gets people interested. It's just a little bit extra, isn't it? If you want to go extra, make a period piece, definitely. If you want a mental breakdown and a heart attack, make a period piece. We shot this in seven days with a crew of just five, which dropped down to three because some people didn't turn up some days. And that's tough. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, hands down, but it was totally worth it. Oh, it's definitely the last day, yeah. And it's raining. Which is shit, because mm. yesterday it wasn't raining. Now it is. I know it is, so. I feel sorry for any of you who are gonna have a crack at it, but if you pull it off, it is one of the most satisfying things you you might ever do. A lot of people said that I shouldn't bother and I couldn't do it, and I, I, I talk about that a lot. If you're thinking about doing this, and people tell you not to, it's up to you, but I'm so happy now that I did it. Because if I hadn't, if I had other ideas, and I think if I hadn't done it, I, to this day I'd be kicking myself. This is kind of in regards to student films in particular, but I broke an awful lot of rules making this film. Um, I went against almost everything my teacher set as a brief, but that's because I made it for myself and I never made this film with the intention of it just to get a grade. Like I never wanted it to just get marked go in a drawer and do nothing except collect dust for the rest of its life. I made it so that it could have a life after university, so it could go to festivals and I could show it to people. It's a proper film. I didn't just make a student film, I wanted to make a proper film. If this video is, is anything, I just want it to be evidence that you could you just give it a good go. But don't try uh, making a sci-fi film on 500 quid or you're insane. <laughs>